Hey everyone, welcome back to The Fin Factor. I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And this is episode number 76. 76, one Sharks player. Araya Hayes. Araya Hayes. I actually remembered this guy. I don't. You didn't? Okay, yeah, he played how many games? 19? Uh, yeah, sure. It's a small handful of games. I, I just, I remembered the name. It was, it was cool. But anyway, uh, this week, uh, obviously we had the week off with the All-Star break and everything, so we're going to do the previous week in review so we're gonna have to look a little bit farther back we're also gonna be talking about some uh, potential trades trade targets and uh, that kind of thing because sharks aren't doing too well so it seems like we might be leaning in that direction so we're gonna talk a lot about that we'll talk about Hassel Hasso Plattner's <laughs> uh, little quote that he had on Doug Wilson and his confidence uh, we'll talk about the all-star game with Tomas Hurtle and how he did and how he got snubbed. <laughs> and and uh, we'll talk about the week ahead, the games this upcoming week. Very good. You ready to start the show? Ready. Super producer Jason, are you ready to start the show? No? Well, that's too bad because we're the three best friends that anyone could have. We're the three best friends that anyone could have. <laughs> Shut up. Hang over. Anyway, so week in review, previous week in review, actually, because, again, we had that all-star break. Uh, we're not really going to go into the games. They happened a long time ago, but we are going to say uh, three games up and three games down. In other words, we got zero out of six points. We lost every single game. Uh, again, two of them divisional opponents, and all three were in the same uh, conference, Western Conference. So um, not a very good week whatsoever for the no. Sharks. No, it was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our last show two weeks ago, I said uh, they need all six points uh, to kind of stay in the race. And if they go 0 for 6, which they did, mm -hmm. uh, for me personally, I'm like, okay, it's time to sell. It's time to move some assets out, get some pieces in for next year or the future, maybe some draft picks and a very deep draft this year. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you're not going to get a top 10 draft pick or anything, but something is better than nothing. Uh, especially with your pending free agents that you have coming up, which we'll get into later. Right. But um, for me, this this last week was kind of a pivotal week for me because now you got about what four weeks left tomorrow. Yep. Uh, well, tomorrow is, as of the recording uh, is the trade deadline, so now you got some time to move some some pieces around right. and make some trades and get some assets back. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, I think it was uh, Sheng Peng had sent this tweet out, and uh, he was talking to uh, to Jumbo. And uh, one of the things he had uh, talked to Jumbo about was, uh, you know, if he still believes that the Sharks can make a run. And Jumbo said, yeah, I, I believe that they can still make a run. And he also said that uh, he hasn't thought about next year or going to another team to chase a uh, cup. And he repeated again, I'm a Shark. Uh, Sheng Peng also followed up. And he said, it's worth noting, however, that Thornton did not rule out a move. And uh, we'll see where the Sharks are closer to the deadline. So, and that's important because he has a clause. Yeah. A no trade clause. So if he's not ruling out a move, though he's not thought about it, guarantee you this is something that's in the back of his mind. I mean, oh, no, I no no player right now is yeah. completely devoid of that thought, right? That, oh, hey, maybe I, I'm not even thinking if we're going to get moved or not. He knows that that's a possibility. What would the locker room be like if he said, yeah, I'm, I'm ready and willing exactly. to move and do what the team needs? That right. obviously means... They're giving you're throwing the talent, right? So yeah, that's not what they want to do. No, and he says, you know, I still believe that we can make this run. So, I mean, of course, it's same thing. You're in that locker room. You're not going to say, Nah, I think our season's over, right? I mean, you you, you can't do that. So, of course, he's going to say, you know, he still believes. Now, whether or not he actually does, maybe a different story. But I think that you know, Jumbo's a pride, uh, proud guy. He's a prideful guy, and uh, you know, he's going to continue to push. And try to get uh, you know this team back on track as best that he can. Realistically, at the end of the day, if they're not able to do that, he's gonna. I would think that he would want to to go and chase that cup. And yeah, as definitely. much as as I'm a shark is such a great thing to hear from him. I think he wouldn't mind being a Avalanche or a Bruin or a anybody else. You're Ray Bork. Yeah, moving at the end of your career. Uh, for those of you who don't remember or know, if you're mm -hmm. too young, Ray Bork was on the Boston Bruins for a very long time. Uh, he was a defenseman. One of the best defensemen in the league, and he got traded to Colorado Avalanche to chase a cup, and eventually, I think on the second year, won um, won his final. I think it was his final year too. It was his final. He retired the, the, yeah. right after they won. Yeah, he retired. Yeah. Uh, Dave Anderchuk was another guy. He was on the Tampa Bay Lightning when the Tampa Bay Lightning won their cup mm -hmm. uh, back in ninety or uh, two thousand three. And uh, same thing, it was his last year, and he was going to retire after that, so he got to go out on a good note. So, uh, Lanny McDonald is another famous one. Yeah. The Calgary Flames back in the 80s. 
so I could just keep going, but I'll stop. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's it's not unknown. I I wouldn't. I would be okay with trading Joe and getting something back for essentially nothing because he's not going to be coming back next year, most likely. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, and Patrick Marlowe, kind of the same thing. He doesn't quite have a, a no trade clause or anything, but out of respect, I would I would want to ask him uh, if he'd be willing to go. Yeah, totally. And and you know, a guy like Marlowe, we talked about this. He probably doesn't have. Uh, I mean, he doesn't have uh, a huge cap hit or anything like that, so yeah. he's probably, you know, a guy that people who are looking for some depth might be interested in. And we'll get into that in just a moment here. But uh, I don't know. Was there was there anything else really to to chat about with regards to uh, uh, Jumbo? Jumbo? And, yeah. Uh, no, no, that's it. Okay, so then I guess we'll just <laughs> jump into that right now. So yeah. actually, speaking of Jumbo and and trades and whatnot, um, one of the things that we were hearing, at least on Twitter sphere, of course, was that Jumbo was going to go to Boston, going back to where the, the team that drafted him, the city that drafted him, uh, to go in and chase a cup and, and win there. So that was one of the things that Aaron just talked about, you know, going in and chasing that cup all la Ray Bork. So uh, we could definitely see something like that happening and be good for Jumbo to get the opportunity. It'd be good for the Sharks to get something in return. Uh, and if Jumbo is a, a Shark, as he says, and he wants to come uh, back into the organization, you know, after the fact, be that as a uh, a player, which again, I think he's going to want to do that. I think he's not really ready to give up playing. Um, Aaron thinks otherwise. I, I think, I, think I don't think he should go back. I think he should call it quits. Yeah. I just feel like the way that, from what I've seen at the practices, I just have a hard time believing he's going to give it all up. Yeah, but I feel like most players are like that. Maybe. The They've, that's all. That's all they've done their entire lives. Practically, he, he right? Goes, he goes to the rink on his off day to shower. Huh? He wants to be at the rink. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe, now again, I, I I do think that he maybe should. Maybe his hot hot water's maybe. broken at home. Who knows? <laughs> I sincerely doubt that. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, Jumbo Joe, a guy that you know the Sharks maybe should be uh, looking at in terms of moving uh, for anything else. You know, again mm -hmm. UFA after this season. Would if he were to resign, would he resign with the Sharks? Absolutely, he would, or he would want to. Um, but I think even if he wasn't going to resign, if he was going to call it uh, end of a career, it'd be great to be able to get something. Uh, for a guy um, who's you know can shore up another team's third line right, right. to get that scoring going for that uh, that depth uh, and be able to bring something back uh, for it and of course you know like I said afterwards he can always come back to the organization. So. I mean, how great would it be if he won a cup? Oh, totally. I, I also think it would be devastating to Sharks fans because Jumbo couldn't win a cup with the Sharks either. Yeah, you know, and then goes to another team and wins it right then and there. Yeah, yeah, that would just be brutal. Kind of. Look at it as a, almost Bitter a waste. Sweet. Almost a waste of his prime years with yeah. us, you know. I don't know. But, yeah. Anyway, Boston, I think, is a good fit for him. Yeah. I also think Colorado would be a good fit as sure. a third line center. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of solidify that lineup uh, a little bit better. Yeah. Good call. So yeah. that, that's kind of the two teams that I would, that would, I mean, I would enjoy watching as yeah. well in the there playoffs. So. I'll probably follow if he goes somewhere. I'd follow that team. <laughs> so, uh, moving on from from Jumbo, there there are some teams that were uh, looking for some help on the defensive defenseman side of mm -hmm. the coin there, and of course we have something to offer in a Brendan Dillon. Now there were I think five teams that I had listed out that were potential matches here. Yep. I know uh, New York Islanders, Carolina Hurricanes, I believe the Florida Panthers. Mm -hmm. I think uh, was Colorado one of those as no, well. No, Colorado Winnipeg. wasn't. Colorado's Winnipeg. got a gluttony. That's right. Yeah, yeah. No, it was Winnipeg. Thank you. Was the yeah. other one, of course. Winnipeg uh, losing what, their top four well, defensemen. Bufflin might be coming back. There's, we've heard that before. Yeah, but he's already skating now, and mm -hmm. like he's actually like getting the process going. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Bufflin back okay. at least. Uh, but yes, they would. They still need help on the blue line. Right, and then the only other team was uh, probably not going to be a trade partner. Yeah. But of note, uh, the Vegas Golden Knights. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an interesting thing with the Vegas Golden Knights, and it's the same thing with the next player we're going to be talking about here in just a second. Um, obviously, Pete DeBoer, now uh, a, the head coach of the Vegas Golden Knights. So, got some familiarity with a couple of these players. So, yeah. though normally you wouldn't be trading to a divisional rival. Uh, this seems like it, it might be a bit of an exception, maybe, in that the head coach may may right. press for a player, right? It could work, you yeah. know? And, you know at, and at the end of the day, it's going to be... He's going to be a UFA next year. Right. So it's not like... He, maybe he'll resign in there. Who knows? But he's probably going to go to the market, I would right. think. And I think even if he did resign with Vegas, is Brendan Dillon really the type of player that the Sharks are scared of another team having, like, that you right. have to go through them? And the Sharks aren't playing Vegas the rest of the season. There you go. If they're not yeah. making playoffs, for sure they're not playing them, so right. they wouldn't have to face them again. 
So it's not out of the question. It's not right. completely out of the question. But I think Pete DeBoer is definitely uh, a good influencer there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there was an article Kurz wrote on uh, when DeBoer was hired, uh, a different one. That okay. When DeBoer was hired, he wrote an article about how the Sharks players found out about it. And and uh, Brendan Dillon that's actually quoted in there, and he gave him very high praise, saying that he changed his career around and helped him become a better player. So mm. um, mutual, yeah. mutual benefit for both of those guys. Um, and again, we don't we don't have any rumors or anything. We're not in, <laughs> on the inside here. This is just kind of our own thoughts, but just throwing that out there yeah. before we get into more. But yeah. um, I, I read that and I was like, oh, that it makes even more sense that he would want to go to Vegas. Not that he has any say in it, but right. uh, he'd be open to it. And and Tabor obviously really liked him. So yeah, I mean, the main takeaway there is that it's a team that has that need. So. Mm -hmm. Possibly. However, I think uh, teams like, uh, in, like Florida, I could see Florida being a really good trade partner. Um, again, an East Coast team, they have that need. In fact, the next player we're going to talk about is also uh, on their list of needs um, in Melker Carlson. Melker mm -hmm. being a more defensively minded forward. Seems like the Florida Panthers are one of those teams that could use uh, some, some depth forwards. Um, that that are more defensively minded for sure and anyone that's I mean Melker has a good pedigree of penalty kill right he's been helping the penalty kill for the last couple of years and it's been elite for mm -hmm. the last few years it still is even though the Sharks are not in the playoff spot their PK is still elite and top of the league so right. um, he's going to have a good pedigree for a team that's going to need a fourth line guy who can go out there and kill penalties and maybe even chip in a few goals mm -hmm. on the penalty kill which would be huge in yeah. the playoffs those goals I feel like they get more I don't know, more adrenaline going for the team than a power play goal okay, or, yeah. or even a five-on-five -five goal, right? Like, it's just so, I don't know, it's a lot more rare and, and just more uplifting yeah. for the team that scores it. Sure, sure, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, could see, uh, I could see a team going for Melker, especially since he's a pending uh, UFA after yeah, the season. Definitely, and another team that w uh, would be Colorado. Yeah, uh, Colorado's got those top two lines that are very dangerous, but when it comes to playing well defensively in their, in their PK and whatnot, I'm sure they could use some help as a far, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the defensive forward standpoint. Now, the interesting thing there was we had said Florida for both Melker and for Brendan Dillon, and I thought that this would make Florida a very good trade partner uh, because if they wanted to fulfill both of those needs, a defensive defenseman and a defensive forward, and you went to two different teams, you're potentially having to give up a bigger package in total than if you were to only have to trade with one team. So if you trade for, say, a Brendan Dillon, maybe you have to give like a second and maybe like a, a middling prospect or something, right? If you want a Melker Carlson, maybe you have to give up a different draft pick, maybe another middling prospect, who knows, right? But if you get both of those needs filled from the same team, mm -hmm. perhaps you only give up like a decent prospect and, and like kind of a lower draft pick, something like that. So it might work out better for Florida to see the Sharks as a trade partner getting both of the needs that they have fulfilled. Um, and, but it also works out well for the Sharks because I would rather have the higher quality prospect you know, by packaging things together that they do need and right. bringing somebody back. Now, we're not really going to go into what each one of these players might be worth or the prospects that might come from those other systems, but you could imagine how packaging a couple players that fills, fulfills both of their needs might bring something back that's, you know, more desirable for the San Jose right. Sharks. That makes sense. Yeah. Better quality coming exactly. back that way. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, moving on from Melker, Let's talk a little bit about the teams that might be in need of a backup goaltender. Now, there's really only one, and again, of course, we're talking about Aaron Dell here. Aaron Dell has one year left on his deal, and his, what, uh, 1.9 million, I believe is what it is, for his cap hit. So, um, you know, and again, like you said, as the season goes on, that cap hit gets diminished for the team that trades for him. So, mm -hmm. um, not as big of a deal that he's got a little bit more money than a typical backup would make. But uh, one team in particular that I saw Toronto being in need of uh, some good backup goaltending. Dell's really, I think, got his stock risen up quite a bit here. I think the last couple games, maybe not so much, but he has shown that given good defensive capabilities around him, he's the type of guy that can be, um, you know, spontaneous and uh, make big saves when they're they're needed. So I could definitely see Toronto going after a guy like Aaron Dell. The problem with Toronto, though, is their cap space is 
like nothing. Yeah. Right. So they would have to give up a player. We talked about you know contracts and whatnot with the San Jose Sharks. That could be a bit of a problem. But it does seem like Toronto is one of those teams that could definitely benefit from having uh, a, a trade that would bring in a decent uh, backup goaltender. Now there are some other goalies that are on the market, but I think a lot of those goaltenders are bigger named, and therefore bring bigger cap. And that would be a bigger problem for the Toronto Maple Leafs to kind of free up some more of their cap to get those. I think that Aaron Dell is a pretty good fit there. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. That's it. I, That's all you got. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not I'm not completely sold on, okay. on Toronto going after Dell because Georgiev. Yes. I, I'm butchering his name. I know it. Georgiev. He's he's not thinking <laughs> on an entry level contract, so sure. it's gonna be even cheaper. That's true. And he's supposed to be on the move. But I mean they're kind of not quite rivals, but who knows? Um but yeah, I, I, Aaron Dell's going to get moved, I think, if possible. Mm-hmm. And I think there is some interest around the league for him. So I think his stock has risen. I think uh, he is, he's going to be a capable backup. Um, I could see a team that would have a kind of an untested goalie, maybe mm-hmm. an untested playoff goalie, who could possibly get rattled, and they would need to throw Dell in, like maybe yank the goalie out and put Dell in to kind of calm things down a little bit, maybe even get back into the game and yeah. maybe win. Um, and maybe towards the end of the season, before they even get to playoffs, give them a couple games, a couple starts. Maybe they have some back-to-backs or mm-hmm. a tough schedule coming at the end, and they, they're going to want somebody to get those points because they're going to need it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there's interest for Aaron Dell and, and that he is kind of solidifying himself as, uh, at most, I wouldn't say a starting goalie, but a 1A, 1B type situation. Sure. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much what you'd want out of your backup. So, if not Toronto, any other teams you can think of that might be in the market for, for backup goaltending? Uh, it's tough to say. Okay. Uh, and... Who knows what could happen between now and the next four weeks because there could yeah. be an injury. Um, I oh, mean, true. Carter Hart just went down uh, with an abdominal strain, I believe, or he's mm-hmm. been out for about three or four weeks. And he's, you know, the starter along with Brian Elliott. There's a 1A, 1B situation, you most likely. So if it turns out to be something a little bit more serious, maybe Philadelphia makes a run for Aaron Dell to kind of get some backups, um, some backup for Brian Elliott, who has been. Kind of his career is he's been a starter, but not <laughs> quite. And kind, he like he does stretches where he does really well, and yeah. then all of a sudden he just tanks, and then he does the same thing. He gets benched, and then comes back and strong. So um, maybe Philadelphia could be another one if they're okay. getting into that playoff line. No, that's a good insight there. I like that. Uh, you probably got that figured out from fantasy. Yeah, I do have Carter Hart. Okay. On oh, two you do. Of my teams. <laughs> so yes, it's frustrating that he's not on the IR. <laughs> and he's still day to day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it kills me. Uh, on the depth scoring front, we talked a little bit about Jumbo Joe, right? So mm-hmm. potentially going to Boston, and then it sounds like maybe Colorado might even be a better fit because they could use some of that depth scoring. Um, Colorado, one of those teams that could use depth scoring. Also, Edmonton, another team. Now, the, the weird thing about Edmonton, again, divisional, so you don't generally see trades happening there. But yeah. guys, uh, I mean, teams that might be looking for some depth scoring, we have... You know, again, Patrick Marlowe, right? So, and he's super cheap, 700K, and it, it'll be pennies, you know, by comparison when they actually get around to trading, if they mm-hmm. end up trading him. Again, Jumbo. And then also a Kevin LeBanc. Kevin LeBanc, man. I, I've been kind of hard on him, I feel like, the last <laughs> month or so, but I would not be too disappointed if the Sharks had moved on from Kevin LeBanc, mainly because I haven't seen a lot of improvement in his. 200 foot game it's it's getting better mm-hmm. but still just a lot of bonehead mistakes that um that i don't think should be made at the nhl level and it's going to keep him back so maybe a change of scenery a, ch- a different coach a different system a different different line yeah. mates you know who knows yeah. so um he could be set up for success as he is somewhere else i think maybe a little bit better um plus he's a pending uh not ufa but a pending rfa, RFA. so whatever team would he get traded to would own the rights to him and, and he would be able to go to arbitration. And I think and that adds value to me. And that adds value because when you trade for a guy uh, who's a UFA, a, if things go well or if they don't go well or whatever the case is, he could still walk, right? Mm-hmm. So you may have, it may have been a pure rental. If there's a guy like Kevin LeBanc that you like the way that, that his, his play is, right? You like how elite he is on the power play, for instance. Um, you, you have the rights to that player. So um, higher chance that you're going to be able to sign this guy for right. you know the the term that you want and for the money that you want. Now, yes, he can't go to arbitration, but again, those are, he's your your player. Uh, he can't go anywhere else. So um, yeah, I think that kind of drives his value up a little bit. And I'm kind of with you. I wouldn't mind seeing Kevin LeBanc maybe uh, get a, a, an opportunity somewhere else. 
um, you know, a different system, like you said. Mm -hmm. Get a shot with some some other players that, you know, Joe Jumbo Joe is great, but uh, you know, I think maybe somebody who's a little more defensively responsible that can pick up the slack. Exactly. Or Kevin LeBanc isn't uh, isn't maybe working out on the two hundred foot game, so um, I, it could be a good move for for both parties. So who knows? It could help out both sides. Yeah, basically. Absolutely. Um, some other players that maybe the Sharks might be interested in trading. Now, there was a couple that I, we had talked about. I think one of them we talked about before. I'm going to start with the other one. Sure. And I'm not sure how you feel about this one, but uh, Ryan Merkley, I think. You know, he's the Sharks' top prospect. He's elite. He's super talented, right? Um, we've seen a lot of weird things with him about being traded from his OHL teams and everything else, and it doesn't seem like anybody wanted him. His own coach was coaching Team Canada, didn't have him uh, on Team Canada. So, um, I, you know, it just seems like there are a lot of weird issues with him. Um, I'm I'm not a fan of, you know, people saying, like, oh, we need to uh, unload because they have, you know, character flaws. I mean, Evander He's, Kane was the same way. Evander Kane came in. To and, me, Merkley, that was so young. He yes. was drafted. He wasn't even 18 when he was drafted. I agree. He was 17 years old. Yeah. I've done some really stupid stuff at 17 <laughs> years old, so I can totally understand. Yeah. Uh, I think he just needed a good mentor and, and put him on the right track, which when he was in training camp, he was living with Burns and doing yeah. all of Burns' uh, day-to-day routine and to kind of see, like, Brent Burns changed his habits. I think when he right around when he turned thirty, uh, started really focusing on health and, mm-hmm. and not that he wasn't really before, but really focusing on it. And uh, I think that's what you kind of need. You need somebody to kind of show you the ropes. Of, yeah. Hey, this is what it takes to be. You want to be a, a player in the NHL and stay in the NHL. This is what you need to do. Right. I think that's kind of it. He's still very young. He's only mm-hmm. nineteen now. Yeah. Is he even nineteen or is he? 18? No, he's. I think he's nineteen. Nineteen. Now. Yeah. Um, still has time to grow. Now, an interesting thing, though, very weird, is um, he his co- his current coach was the coach picking for World Juniors and did not pick him. Right. That kind of says a lot. That's, yeah. So you kind of, I mean, I, I understand what you're yeah. saying. You can't take it, but you also get, can't ignore it at the right. same time. So that, I think, was a maybe not a big flag, but kind of a, an eye-raising, like, why did, was he left off? See, and for me, it's not so much let's trade him because, uh, you know, he's... He's, you know, uh, too, what do you call it? Um, he's too risky. poisonous or too risky or whatever the word's going to be. You know, I don't think that's why I would necessarily trade him, but I feel like this is a guy that, you know, he is kind of like an unknown at this point. You're not really sure, kind of like a draft pick, right? You're not really sure what you're going to get with that draft pick. With Ryan Merkley, it's, you know, he's a supremely talented guy, but it could also totally blow up in your face and not really work out. So it's kind of like, well, what if we used him? What if we used him as trade bait right. to bring something else back? Now, could Ryan Merkley bring back like a first? First round pick? M- maybe. For a team that depends on where it is in the first for round. For a team that doesn't have the defensive depth and needs yeah. a guy like an Eric Carlson or a Brent Burns in, in a couple of years. We wouldn't be trading that at the deadline. No, 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 no. Not at the deadline yeah. necessarily. No, no, no. But I'm just saying if we were to package and whatnot, right. this is another guy that that we could see potentially get in the moved. off season. Sure, why not? More, more likely in the off season. Yeah. Well, and then the next guy, same thing that you think more likely in the off season. But I talked about this last time, but Yeah. But at the trade deadline, I could definitely see Brent. Burns possibly being a guy. Now again, this is where people get upset. Okay, <laughs> this is where people get upset. They say, yeah, you know, you know, don't like hearing Brent Burns get, uh, about him getting moved. Um, for me, again, it comes down to I have no problem with him. It's just that we already have a supremely talented offensive blue liner, and there is other needs on this team than having Brent Burns be there alongside Eric Carlson. You just gave Eric Carlson eleven and a half million dollars for eight years. You've committed to that player. Now, granted, you committed to Brent Burns when you gave him that contract, yes. However, I feel like Brent Burns could be used in a business sense to bring back a player that we really need up front. We need a more talented player on on the forward core. Somebody who's dynamic, uh, potentially a prospect of another team who's ready to break out, but that team could use some big help offensively from the blue line, whatever Mm -hmm. team that may be. I'm just saying this is where it makes sense. I'm not saying I necessarily you want the to Edmonton go. Edmonton Oilers could be the Edmonton <laughs> Oilers. There you go. So again, that's that's I just I see it that Brent, way. Brent Burns is one of the guys that I had said before that I could see be moved in the off season. Yes. But now I can see 
he could potentially be moved by the deadline because uh, a team would need him for the playoffs. Because if a team is really, right. you know, if and they're I, on the cusp, I and they can see coming back would be draft pick. Yes, uh, exactly. Prospect and maybe even Roster. a bad contract. Okay, that a a player that's not playing that's a bad contract okay. that's kind of buried. Maybe doing that because I mean that's eight million dollars coming off of our books. Yeah. We don't really need the cap space at this point for the rest of the season. Right. Then we could take that off of their books and because he's still signed for another five seasons. So yeah, that's a lot for a team to take on. And yeah, and don't get me wrong. If you move Brent Burns, it does make more sense to do it uh, at the draft as opposed to exactly at, at, during the the deadline here. But at the same time, if a team wants to have supreme offensive ability from the blue line, right, and they're looking for a playoff run. I mean, I'm sure people are yelling or, yeah, or, totally. or typing right now, like, you know, why would you get rid of Brent Burns? Plus, he has a no-trade clause. Yes. Well, his modified no-trade clause is he submits a team, a three-team list in the beginning of the season, I believe, yeah. um, of the teams that he could want to go to. That just means they can work a deal out without asking him about it and just right. doing it. Otherwise, they're going to, it's like a no-trade clause where he could just deny it yeah. or <laughs> deny it or whatever veto veto yeah. thank you <laughs> wrong word uh he could veto it so it doesn't mean a trade can't be worked out they could work it out lay it out to him and be like here look this team wants you they want you for playoffs we think it's a good fit we're getting a lot of this in return and he'll say yeah. okay you know you're right i think it's time to move on you know the other thing i was thinking about with with bernsey is um you know he was so close with pavelski and he's so close with jumbo um I don't know if Pavelski leaving has maybe affected some of his play a little bit, and I'm sure it has, obviously, the tipping and whatnot. But I'm just saying from a camaraderie standpoint. And then just like Joe, uh, just like Aaron believes that Joe is on his way out after this season, you know, the Beard brothers would be gone. Um, <laughs> Burns and Pavelski, right. that's already kind of gone. So I feel like he wouldn't even be necessarily opposed to it. Not that he doesn't have any of the friends on the team, don't get me wrong, but... Right. I feel like those were like his two closest buddies on the team. Mm -hmm. And with Pavs out and Jumbo's basically on his way out, I think he would be more receptive to a move. But who knows? Yeah. Maybe maybe a move to Dallas. Who knows? That's what I think. <laughs> That'd be nuts. His, his ranch is in Texas. Yeah, his ranch is in Texas and so is Pavs. I mean, right. that's you rejoin your buddy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Um, again, I don't want to see him go, but I could definitely see how from a business sense it makes sense. So... That's eight million dollars off your books. Yeah, that's and plus there's a bunch of people, other people coming. We talked about this in the show. Nine million dollars coming off of the books uh, from UFAs. Just UFAs alone. Eight million would be another Burnsy right there over another eight million. So that's seventeen. Million. That means Doug Wilson would be spending a lot uh, in the off season for UFAs, bringing in more depth coming in this. Week. On top of the players that you'd already be getting back from those trades. Right. So again. So not not the heart move, but maybe the head move. Maybe the business sense one that makes sense for getting this team right, right back into playoff contention. And we'll, we're going to talk more right. about this in a little bit later but in our show, too. Okay. Uh, but let's talk about the untouchables. Yes. Who do you think would be untouchable in trading or getting rid of? Oh, uh, are you asking are me or are you asking sure. me? Sure. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what I think. Go for it. I think Hurdle. Definitely Hurdle. Uh, Carlson. Eric. Eric Carlson. Sorry, not Melker. <laughs> Sorry, Melker. Uh, Eric Carlson, and I think Vlasic is untouchable. Okay. And I say that because, for one, Vlasic and Carlson have no movement clauses, which is even harder than a no-trade clause. Um, so it just makes things more difficult. Right. But um, I feel like those three those three are kind of the piece. Now, I didn't mention Couture or yeah. Kane. Yeah, yeah. Or Burns, obviously we just okay. talked about Burns, um, I, or even Timo. I didn't say Timo. What is that guy? Kyle. Kyle's gonna be upset with oh, you. Oh, I'm sure. He's yeah, gonna, he's, he's mad. Gonna be typing away and angry. It's Timo's mom. Searching back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're right. I think Hurdle for sure. I, I especially after this uh, this All Star weekend with Hurdle, yeah. which we'll get to in a second here. But I, I feel like you know he's. He's kind of like the the fun heartbeat of that team. I mean, really, you know, uh, he works hard all the time. You see that guy; um, he's he's really coming to form with the type of player that we thought he was going to be. He's got and the A this season. Yeah, 
He's got the That's ad. A big deal. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think you're absolutely right on Hurdle. Hurdle's a guy you don't move. Eric Carlson, again, you just gave him this huge contract. He's not a guy that's going to get unloaded because, I mean, if, if for any other reason, it would just be an admission of some sort of fault it, by Doug Wilson by giving him that contract. And I don't think that Doug Wilson would be admitting any sort of fault, at least not right now. So I can't imagine that Eric Carlson goes. I think you're 100% right on that one. Um, going back to Logan Couture saying that you didn't mention him, I kind of feel like he he is a guy that you're not going to trade. Now, whether or not he's untouchable, I don't know. But I don't think that he's a guy that they're going, I wonder what we can get for Couture. I don't think that that's <laughs> happening. No. If they came back and if somebody came and said, hey, we want Logan, exactly. and we gave you a stupidly ridiculous package for it, I think they'd have to consider it. But I don't think Logan's one of the guys that they're going, okay, you know, he's he's on the block. He's you know, yeah, It's not like they're shopping Logan. Exactly. Right? That's what I mean to yeah. say. Thank you. So, um, no, I, but I'm with you. I, I don't think Hurdle's touchable. I don't think Carlson's touchable. And I think that Timo Meyer is. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right. I think you're right on Timo. And it sucks because I think he could be the type of player that, you know, like, like Hurdle is, for instance. You know, he could be that. Right. And maybe he's still getting that way. I mean, he's still young too, 23, 24. Something. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say I'm giving up on Timo, but because um, he's also a power forward. Those take a lot longer yeah. to develop than any other position practically. So, and he's still very young. Mm -hmm. I, it's more of like an attitude thing, I think. Okay. That's that's more of what it is for me. I don't know. I just don't. Not that anything matters of what I say, but <laughs> he just kind of, I don't know, just doesn't rub me the right way. And yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why. Last little bit about that when you mentioned Vlasic being untouchable. Honestly, I feel like Vlasic uh, has the type of attitude where if if he wanted to go somewhere else, he would just go. He would just uh, trade me. Yeah. Like, I feel like every time I see him at the at the practice rink, it's I don't know. I get this vibe from him like he doesn't necessarily want to be there. He's just like, okay, I'm going to work. Uh, like to him, it's a job, you yeah. know. And if he has to go to a different job site, then so be it. Like that's just kind of the vibe that I get sometimes. I know his words may be something different, but that's again. I go to the practices. That's the vibe that I get. His so, uh, his interviews are, yeah, <laughs> are interesting. I'll say, but I can imagine if a team came calling and he was interested at all, that deal would get done. So I don't know that Vlasic is untouchable. I just don't think that Vlasic is necessarily a guy that they have, again got on the block. But um, I think that he would get traded before Couture would get traded. I'll mm -hmm. put it that way. So. Um, Regardless, that's that's kind of our list. Why don't you go ahead and put down in, in the comment section down below uh, the guys that you think <laughs> might be untouchable, the guys that you think might be on the way out if we didn't happen to mention them here, or if you happen to agree or disagree, please go ahead and let us know that as well. I think that'd be interesting to go through the comments, and we're pretty good about getting back to you, so yeah. uh, feel free to put those in there. and Just we'll, be cordial. Yeah, try to be, <laughs> try to be cordial. Do the best you can. Right. Okay, so what's uh, what's up next here? We talked about uh, the untouchables. Uh, so. Well, let's talk about that first-round pick. Okay. That was traded for uh, Eric Eric Carlson. It was a conditional one. If he had signed with the Sharks, they would get our first overall pick. I think too many people are kind of focusing on that and that it's going to be a first overall pick. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I hope I'm wrong. It better not be a first overall pick. It's a pick. lottery pick. It's a lottery yeah. pick. What I think the Sharks are going to do is they're going to be one of the... Um, they're not going to make playoffs, but they're going to be up there. And it's not going to be a top five, six, seven pick. I think it might be between that 10, 15 range or so, mm -hmm. which doesn't hurt as bad as, wow, we just lost out on the number one consensus pick, which right. I forget his name, some French name, French Canadian name. But, <laughs> um, it, like, that's not going to, he's not, we're not missing out on him. Now, I hope I don't eat my words and <laughs> they somehow win the lottery with their 1% chance in getting the first overall, but... Um, God, I would just get roasted in the comments yeah. that happened. But uh, it, it, to, again, it's yeah, sure, it's a deep draft. It's going to be a good player, but it's going to be like a we're missing out on a Timo Meyer player. Okay, a good, great player. Yes, but not a generational talent or a even a game changing kind of player. You okay. know what I mean? Like he's never going to lead the NHL in scoring. Okay, he'll be up there, but he'll never lead it. We're not missing out on one of those players. Okay, that so it's people are a little dramatic about. Yeah, it, I think. See, and for me, and I, we talked about this during the live, would you rather have that player, right, or the potential for that player, right. or would you rather have the known quantity in Eric Carlson? I would rather have the known quantity in Eric Carlson. I know this guy is a two-time Norris Trophy winning defenseman. I know this guy generates big time from the blue line. 
I mean, the number of assists that he's racked up. Is he not tied for for top in scoring now? He is. He tied Logan Couture. He's played more games than Logan because Logan's out, but uh, he's Fair. not tied as of today. He's tied in the lead in scoring. Yeah, the point is he's a blue liner. Right. That's the point. He's a blue liner. So, again, this is where I, w- I look at it and I go, you, you know what? You also say it's our highest paid player who's now leading the team. Fair. There scoring. you go. There you go. So, I, I think, you know, for me, it's, you know, we look at trading away your first. Oh, we're always trading away our first for these guys. Yeah, but you, you know you're getting Evander Kane. You know you're getting Eric Carlson. You know you're getting these guys that are NHL quality players that have already played there that have, you know, they, they're scoring goals or they're making nice plays or what. You know what you're getting. With a lot of these other guys, especially like a Timo Meyer type player, you're not really sure if he's going to have a 60-point season or a 30-point season. He's kind of like in flux. So, you know, again, for me, I understand where trading that first away uh, makes the most sense to get the player that you know that you, that you know what he is, right? right. So uh, I'm okay with it. And, you know, again, this one, again, unless it's, you know, one of those, you know, where he happens to get in the top three, which would absolutely suck. Yeah. But... Is Eric Carlson, you know, uh, as good as, or would you, if you were to draft, would Eric Carlson be a type of player that goes in those top three? I feel like he's talented enough. Like if you knew that Eric Carlson was going to be, but if you knew Eric Carlson was going to be Eric Carlson, right? Right. Would you take him as a one, two, or a three? I think most teams would have. Yeah. Right. So I don't know. To me, it's it's a bit of a wash. I don't think it's going to be a one, two, or three pick. I think it's going to be later on in the rounds. And I think you're right. And I like that comparison that you just drew. I think it's going to be a Timo Meyer type player, a very so, good player, yeah, a very solid player. The Sharks, but not def- Eric. But I mean, the Sharks need that. Yeah. But it's not going to destroy the franchise over it. Okay. Is my point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's like, oh wow, Doomsday. We just missed out on drafting Connor McDavid. Right. Like that would be awful. Right. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Totally. So it's not going to be like that. That's my point. Okay, very good. So we'll move on from that, and uh, actually kind of similarly similarly related, uh, Doug Wilson, Hasso Plattner. Um, so everyone was kind of saying, you know, is Doug on the hot seat now because the season's kind of a bust, and he went out and spent all this money, and we couldn't get it done, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Hasso Plattner came out with a comment basically stating that, you know, Doug Wilson's job is essentially not in jeopardy. Like he was saying, there's a big vote of confidence for Doug Wilson, and that he believes in the vision, he believes in what he's uh, he's doing. All right, I'll just read what Platner had said. He said, "While we're all very disappointed in the team's performance thus far this season, Doug has a long history of le- leading our team to success. The last time we failed to meet our winning standards in the 2014-15 season, we were able to quickly rebound and reestablish a winning culture for the next several years." I'm supportive of Doug's plan to get our team back on track. I think that's a huge statement coming from the owner. Oh, yeah. Uh, that he has full trust in Doug Wilson. And kind of what we did, talked about earlier, all these people are coming off the books of the UFAs, yeah. just alone the UFAs. They're going to get their depth next year. Yeah. I think I think Platner knew all along what right. the plan was. It's his money that's going out to spend for these players. So it's not like uh, Doug Wilson just pulled out a blank check and right. gave Carlson all his money and Hassel's going, what are you doing? <laughs> like, he sat down, there's a plan, there's, they're business people, they know and they understand how it works. So I'm sure, we talked about this in the live, I think what happened is they laid it out and Doug Wilson said, we're going to sign Carlson to this deal, this is what the team's going to look like next year, we're not going to have enough money for depth players, we're going to kind of see what can come up through the organization, who can plug in the holes, who can play, who can play w- up to their potential, because yeah. we need them to. Unfortunately, this season just did not go the way that they thought. Some of those guys did not perform well. The the guys that needed to go play higher are not playing that high, right? That high game. The guys coming up from the organization did not make it. Like they're just not good enough. So, I think this year was kind of uh, well. I think we can get into the playoffs with what right. we have at the core, and they're going to kind of drag up everyone else. And it didn't happen. So now we're going to reboot and redo it next year. Yeah. Next year, we'll have a lot more uh, movement, a lot more depth added to the team because we'll have a lot more st- stuff coming off the books. Yeah, 100%. I think Hasso knew mm-hmm. that this season, not like a burn season, not like you get thrown it out the window. Again, we have good players. We should be able to make playoffs, and by all accounts, we should have, uh, and maybe we still will. Who knows? But I think at, at this point, that's kind of what they were thinking was, we'll be good enough to to get in and that's it right we may not win it all but this isn't an all-in season you look at back to last season that was an all-in season we grabbed carlson we grabbed nyquist we were loaded up mm-hmm. right and we got close but i think that Hasso knew 
this season was not going to be an all-in season. This season was going to be a just good enough season and that we were looking more towards the future. And I think that's why Hasso came out with the vote of confidence for Doug was that he already kind of knew that this season wasn't going to be just like the last one, that we're loading up for the future. That That's why we gave Eric Carlson this eight-year deal was so that we have him for the future, for the long run. And if that costs us a little bit in terms of depth and maybe even playoffs in hindsight, uh, for for this season alone, then so be it. But we'll be better for it in the coming seasons. And I think that's why, again, Hasso doesn't have a problem with it and why Doug Wilson's seat is not lukewarm, especially right. at this yeah. point. So, uh, and, and you had some comments about Hasso being kind of a hands-off owner too. But he is. I mean, these owners are billionaires that these teams are not, they're not made to make money. Most, most not even just NHL, but most uh, sports teams mm-hmm. are not in the business to make money. They're there for entertainment. It's the billionaire's little pet projects on the <laughs> side that they get together with their other billionaire friends and they kind of brag about their little hobbies. Right. I mean, he's the CEO and, and runs SAP, lives in Germany. He's out here several times a year, but this is not his main job. So, And whether or not you agree with that like, it should happen or you should have a different owner that's more involved, it doesn't matter. They're right. bankrolling the thing. So he has full trust in Doug Wilson, his whole team, the whole staff, that they're going to put together some winning seasons, which they have. They're going to win a cup, which they will. Yeah. And uh, so he's, he's more of a... I mean, one quote from him that really kind of stuck to me and why I think that Doug Wilson's not in the hot seat is people are complaining about the SAP Center how old it is, it's the third oldest arena in the NHL, and it needs to be rebuilt, built, torn down, rebuilt, uh, put somewhere else, all kinds of stuff, right? right. Hasso was like, man, you Americans are kind of funny. You always want to tear down what you have and build something new, <laughs> when what you have is great, you just need to fix it up every now and then. Yeah. So to me, that's like, he doesn't Microcosm want for the team. <laughs> right, he doesn't want to tear it all down and build it all up again. He doesn't want to get rid of Wilson and find someone else and do yeah. all that. So I just think, I think Doug Wilson's, not in the hot seat. Yeah, and it's you know it's not such a bad thing, really. I mean, again, I think Doug Wilson's done a phenomenal job. I don't think there's many GMs around the league that could have you know done what he's done and make a team competitive uh, for as many years as mm-hmm. it has been. Uh, it's come to a head this season, it seems. But um, I mean, there's just too many years of success, if you will. I know we haven't won a cup, but I would think making the playoffs 14 out of 15 seasons is considered a, a successfully ran franchise. Yeah. So. Done with that. Okay, so moving on from that topic, we've got the weird topic of Pete DeBoer getting hired in so Vegas, weird. but on top of that, Gallant getting fired, yeah. which I think is just bizarre. Gallant was, he was, what, two years removed from making the Stanley Cup Finals of the first year team, got to game seven yeah. against the Sharks the year before, probably should have won that series. Maybe that's what he got fired over, was yeah. the five minute. The four goals in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, they took their sweet time firing him. If that was the, that was the case, uh, but yeah, it just didn't make sense. The guy, I mean, again, like you said, they're a handful of points out of first in, in the Pacific. They they seem like they're they're doing just fine. They have a better roster than what they started with when they when they did the uh, the expansion draft. I mean, they're they're only getting better. And Gallant didn't seem to be like a problem there. So it was just kind of like out of the blue. It just didn't just it didn't took, make sense. A lot of Vegas fans were kind of really angry about it too. Yeah, uh, I mean, they're Vegas fans, but. They get really angry because they didn't like Pete DeBoer because he's been the Sharks yeah. head coach. So they're like, why would they do that? Right. So and then there's, you know, the conspiracy theorists. Like, <laughs> just, the NHL's doing this on purpose. Like, I, no, your ownership is the one that fired yeah. and hired. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway. So, yeah, I just, it's just, just odd. a really weird thing seeing Pete DeBoer standing there in a Vegas Golden Knights jumpsuit uh, and a hat. Uh, it was just really odd. I think the Vegas Knights probably wanted to get rid of Gallant maybe after the season. And then they said, "Well, Pete DeBoer is on the on the market. Right. There's probably a bunch of interest from other teams. We want to jump on it first. We want to get him in here. Um, hopefully, salvage this season for right. them because right. they keep they're bouncing in out of playoffs, just like not like the Sharks, but they're in and out of a playoff spot. Uh, hopefully, they he can help solidify it, and then um, they don't have to worry about another team hiring him." In the offseason. Right, right. So I think that's what they were hoping for. So, and the other weird thing about Gallant is you hear some people talking about, well, what if we pulled the switch on him? Ugh. And why Gallant makes sense to come into San Jose? Look, uh, the only thing I want to say about this, and this is pretty much the only thing I'm going to say, is that Doug Wilson is weighing his options. Uh, is Gallant in the running? Sure. As much as Peter Laviolette is, as much as Bob Bugner is. Right, these are guys that you know are all you know they've they've, they've coached in the NHL at some point or mm-hmm. another. 
And, um, you know, he's not like ruling anybody out right away unless there's something that he doesn't like about him. So anybody who's available, trust me, they're all looking at every single person. It doesn't matter if he used to work for a rival or not. Obviously, Vegas has shown us that, right? So my only take on that is he's looking at anything and everything that's available. I do like that Bob Bugner, uh, what he, he has done with this team so far. I think he's shored up a lot of the defensive uh, issues that they've had. Right. And I think that maybe should be rewarded with uh, maybe another year or two behind the bench and see where he goes. He hasn't really been able to implement his own system either. That's true. It's, it's just kind of tweaking what was already there because it's halfway through the season. He couldn't even get a coaching staff together, so they had to basically pull up all the AHL, uh, the Barracuda yeah. coaching staff to help him out. Yeah. And there was an article Kurz wrote about it, like just kind of explaining like how you know, the first couple like week <laughs> of them all together, <laughs> they were not communicating well with each other or yeah. the team. Like it was just kind of a hot mess. So now it's better. Now they're kind of all on the same page and it's running better. And maybe the team's not winning as much as they would like to, but uh, things are, are turning around. So Bugner, of course, he said, of course, I would want the head coaching job. I'm not right. going to lie and say I don't. Yeah. Um, I, he just wants to get some time in there to implement his own system and get his own coaching staff. Yeah. So I think he's probably the number one in the running. For me, um, I think Doug Wilson's going to have up the number one. Mm -hmm. And then, depending on who knows who else can get fired between now and then from That's other true. teams, those coaches just get recycled around so much. So, yeah. Uh, hot take. Uh, Pete DeBoer will not make it to the end of the season, and we will rehire him. <laughs> so, uh, moving on from that. Bad take. <laughs> moving on from that. Uh, All-Star game. It was this weekend. It was. Um, the, kind of the highlight for, for, maybe for you, I'm not sure, but the uh, elite women's three-on-three. Three. Again, first time that the women have competed at an All-Star game. Mm -hmm. I think it was awesome. I did too. Um, the, the season prior in San Jose, uh, Kendall Coyne Schofield did the uh, fastest lap mm -hmm. competition uh, because Nathan McKinnon was injured at the time. And so they said, you're not going to demonstrate it. You're going to compete. Um, Kind of her name's kind of blown up, you know, since yeah, then, really. Totally, I mean, yeah. total, and I think it's great, I think it's awesome, you know, that there's you know, kind of like a, a singular point, like a representation, you know, like a, a representative, I should say, uh, for you know, elite women's hockey. And they were on display this weekend in St. Louis at the All Star game. They had a three on three game, uh, by all accounts, it was a pretty entertaining game. It was, I watched most of it, I mean, as much as I could with my two kids running around, mm -hmm. but um, it was more exciting to me than the All Star game <laughs> because they were actually trying. They were really playing hard and really trying their best. So the All-Star game, they're kind of, you know, it's like basketball. Like, there's no defense in the <laughs> All-Star game, right? They don't, they're not going to try and, and hurt themselves. Yeah. Um, even in the in the the finals, I guess it is, of, of the All-Star game part, uh, they were trying a little bit harder, but still not. I mean, how many breakaways <laughs> do they have, right? Right. So, come on. But the girls, <laughs> I mean, they were really competing really hard. And the Van the Vancouver, the Canadian goalie was Close amazing. <laughs> yeah, she was amazing. And, I, and it was the same one from the Olympics. Wasn't it USA versus Canada? And she just, the Canadian goalie was amazing. I think it's De Debian it was the, the name of the goalie. I can't yeah. remember. Yeah. Uh, she seemed really big in the net. Like, she just covered the wet. Like, all of her angles were really well. Mm -hmm. I thought she played really well. Uh, U.S. had a lot of chances and just could not bury him she's like, shutting him down it, to me it felt like I was watching the Sharks like wow they get all these chances and just can't score and of course they're gonna lose and they lost 2-1 to one. so it was a close game um, yeah I, 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 but it was entertaining to me it was absolutely. very entertaining absolutely and I can't remember who it was that had tweeted out saying that they had recorded the game it was like um, it was a higher up it was a blue check mark name um, it was saying that basically he had recorded it and his two daughters were watching it and it like made all the difference like yeah. for, for his daughters like they were like you know very uh, very into it, very impressed, and um, you know, got them kind of jacked up and jazzed and ready to to, to play and everything. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's great. I think it's great that the NHL is kind of helping to showcase this, and that it's you know kind of something that you know little girls all over the the world are able to kind of focus in on, check out. And I think it's awesome that Kendall Coins kind of the center of that, the forefront of all of that, right? So um, it, it's great that she's using kind of that limelight, mm -hmm. um, you know, for for that and and. Um, you know, promoting the game amongst uh, other girls and other women. And, uh, you know, hopefully this is something that's, you know, the NHL can kind of, you know, help out a little bit more and, and get them in the in the spotlight. I'd like to see it every year. Totally. the All-Star game. I'm, I was not, I'm not joking. Like, I was more entertained by that game <laughs> just because it was like a serious game. Perhaps you were more entertained because uh, the NHL done messed up. 
Uh, so Hurdle getting snubbed as the All Star MVP. Uh, the the reason and I, I use my air quotes when I say snubbed. Okay, uh, it, they had a Twitter poll. Uh, four players, I believe it was one player from each division, saying who was the, the MVP, the NHL All-Star MVP, and Hurdle's name was not on there. Hurdle ended up getting the most goals, and he had a natural hat trick, and he got the game-winning goal that you know for, for the final and game. I saw nobody had ever scored a natural hat trick in the All-Star game before. First one, there yeah. you go. So like I, everything was kind of like, hey, Hurdle should be the guy. But they put the poll out before he had scored that game-winning goal for the final game. So I think that if they had done that poll after the fact, it might have gone a little bit differently. And I know a lot of people are saying East Coast bias, but it really it was just he was never one of the four choices in the first place. So yeah. Leon Dreisaitl was the representative from the Pacific, I believe. So that's kind of part of it. Again, snubbed, but it's sort of yes, no, not really. There needs to be a different way to do that because I agree. Twitter polls, you can only put four options. Like that's ridiculous. There you go. That, that's how you're doing it. Yeah. Come on. Come on, NHL. That's kids play. <laughs> yeah, I would think that, you know, the hockey writers or anybody else other than just fans who need to vote immediately. They're just trying to get interaction. Yeah. I get it. But how about a who do you think should be the NHL All-Star I was going to say, you can have two. A fan choice and the writer's choice. Right. Writer's association, whatever it is. That makes sense. Whatever yeah. is what it is. He didn't really care that uh, he didn't get the All Star MVP. He was totally fine with it. He didn't want the car. There was one really <laughs> cool uh, quote there where he was talking about playing with uh, Anze Kopitar. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? Actually, we'll go ahead and we'll play that clip, clip yeah. right now. What was it like to play with Kopitar instead of against him? You gave me some nice setups, didn't you? Yeah, we got, I think, some great chemistry. It was actually fun, you know. We, before 70 years, we hate each other, but now we hang out, you know. So it's, but it's all good, you know. We have, Great time, you know, and I, I, and you know, it was fun play with other guys, you know, like Angie, you know, Max, Connor, all these guys. It was a lot of fun on the bench. So yeah, he's uh, saying he's hated the guy for seven years, and then all of a sudden they're buddies, right? So it's, it's just really funny. It's funny. This whole interview is just one word, <laughs> just one long word sentence. It's going. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just playing with him all the time. When we get <laughs> it's like take a breath, man. Yeah, it's funny. He's anyway. just excited. He's so excited about life. It's great. <laughs> You gotta love to watch. He's funny. You can't not watch him ever and not smile. <laughs> anyway, uh, moving on from that, uh, all that said and done, we've got some games to play, and it's on Tuesday. No, it's not. It's on Monday. <laughs> so really strange. We're having normally, normally the home games are Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and this week we have Monday, Wednesday, Saturday. All home games. They're th yeah, throwing us for a loop there. Okay, so Monday we open up against Anaheim Ducks, our favorite. Band-Aid boy, John Gibson, <laughs> in that. Aaron Dell is starting tomorrow. Band-Aid boy? Any, any uh, wonder. Okay. Um, yeah, that's already been confirmed. Okay. But, um, it's interesting because this show's going to be coming out after the game. True. So how do you think the game's going to go? Uh, how do you think, think the game went? So, no, the Sharks won, <laughs> right? Yeah, it was like a 4-2 win and... I don't know, I'm guessing here. Enjoy. No, I could definitely see the Sharks winning this game. Um, I think this is, you know, they come out of the break. They've uh, got their rest. Same thing with Anaheim. They've got their rest. But I feel like this is, you know, the Sharks kind of uh, move here to say, okay, are we actually trying right now? Because if we're actually trying, we should beat Anaheim. Yeah. Right. If they don't beat Anaheim, okay, fine. I submit. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, I think Anaheim, this is a game. The Sharks come out. They play hard. They play well. They win. And the Sharks are up against some major adversity right now. Yeah. And it's it's good to see when your team is down, how do they respond? Who responds? Yeah. More importantly. And who do you want around you when you're in this kind yeah. of spot? So I think uh, and the players are going to be on edge for the next month because of the trade deadline. They know it's going to come. They know they're, any any phone call from Doug Wilson yeah. or any, any meeting like, hey, go meet Doug in his office. It's, oh, here it is. So... Everyone is just kind of yeah. waiting for it right now. So it'll be interesting to see how they do um, this next month, the yeah, month of February, right. practically. Um, but yeah, they should definitely win this game. I think Hurdle pulls an all-star game and scores four goals. <sighs> just saying. <laughs> I said four to two, didn't I? Regardless, Wednesday against Vancouver again, Vancouver again, a home game. So how do you think that one's going to go? Man, I said last time they should beat Vancouver and they would beat them, <laughs> and they did not. So okay, um, I don't know that Vancouver's uh, goalie Markstrom was in the All Star game and he kind of got not, shelled. Yeah, I think that's a little <laughs> uh, confidence killer there. Okay, and a little fatigue in there too, because you're playing against the best of the best, and that's just 
who aren't really confidence. trying, but yeah, okay. Yeah, but imagine if he shut him out, you know, he'd feel better, come out better. Okay. You get shelled, you're kind of like, uh, okay, let's just get back to it. <laughs> I don't know. That's just throwing so it out think, there. So you think that's a win? I mean, at this point, they need to not lose, so. Okay. Um, I think, uh, sure, I'll say it's a win. <laughs> So confident in your reply. Okay, then we go and we I just play. don't know anymore this we team. <laughs> it's so hard. Uh, back at home again on Saturday. Saturday we are playing the Tampa Bay Lightning. Ooh, baby, that's a loss. Yeah. <laughs> See, now I'm going to say they're going to lose to Anaheim. Oh, They'll wow. go to overtime against Vancouver, and they're okay. going to beat the Lightning. Sure. Because it's the Sharks. Don't you know? think so. I think I think Tampa Bay is a scheduled loss. That's that's how I, I see that one. I Not think that one's a loss. loss. That's a loss to me. Well, they're playing Wednesday and then Saturday. They got plenty of rest. Cool. That's a scheduled loss. <laughs> a scheduled loss. Okay, sure. I think anytime you play Tampa Bay and you're playing this poorly, yeah. I don't care if you have ten days in between. Scheduled loss is more of you're traveling and it's a back to back and you're playing a Tampa Bay team mm -hmm. after playing a team the night before. Mm -hmm. That's a scheduled loss. That's great. I don't care how many days off you have in between when you're Whatever. playing this poorly and you're playing Tampa Bay. I'm sorry for you guys. It's this way. Anyway. You're not using the word that's supposed to be mean. Regardless. <laughs> so, uh, is that that's it for the week ahead? That's it for the week. There's no ahead. Sunday game, so nope. we're good. And we're not even doing fantasy because fantasy is. Like you got two weeks, right? You it's said? two weeks because the All Star game. Yeah, yeah. Guys, that's the end of the show. <laughs> that was, thanks that for, was a quick one, wasn't for it? Lasting this long, yeah. Yeah, it's not bad. If you made it to the end of the show, please leave a comment at the end. Said I made it <laughs> with no great. other context. That's great. Just I made it. Yeah. No other context. Okay. And people are gonna be like, "What are you talking about?" Uh, visit the store. You wanna visit the store? Yeah. There you go, go to thefinfactor.com and uh, help us help support the show. You can get a T-shirt. You can get a hat. You can get some stickers. Uh, it's all on there. Just go click on the support the show tab and you will see everything we got. Um, Please make sure that you hit the subscribe button, by the way, yeah, if you've not sure. subscribed already. No, I see a lot of you guys that are uh, uh, coming and you are subscribed to the show already. And I see a lot of them. I think it's like almost 50% people coming and checking out the show that are not subscribed. Folks that are maybe searching for us. And I think it's great that a lot of the traffic comes from the Finn Factor being searched in YouTube. However... Why bother? Just hit the subscribe <laughs> button, guys. So hit that sub button, hit that bell. Uh, you will know when we are going live, which is also a lot of fun. We had, uh, for a week that we had off, essentially, there was a, quite a few people yeah, that came in for the lives. Had some great questions, some fun interactions, some good comments. Uh, people were still checking out the shoes. It does go um, off the rails at some point. It, it absolutely does, but that's the fun part, yeah. is it not? So anyway, uh, again, thank you guys for uh, tuning in. We love uh, chatting with you guys. So for Super Producer Jason, I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And we will see you guys next week. Next week, I guess, yeah. Sure. Yeah, next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, check out our other content, especially interviews. You can interact with us directly through social media at The Fin Factor and on Instagram at Fin Factor. And don't forget to join our live streams on YouTube. Visit our website at thefinfactor.com where you'll find all of our episodes as videos or podcasts. You'll also find our exclusive merchandise to help support our show.